with embracing imperfection, you're really able to bring about a lot more authenticity and joy in the present moment. And being authentic is very endearing, and I think we all have a, a very dear uh, place in our hearts for that, and we all notice that. And tell them a little bit about your work. <laughs> I'm, like I'm automatically passing it down. <laughs> so my work is, is uh, evolving as well. So I started out with just resin. It's all layers of resin and different types of paints and pigments on birch wood. So I hand carve and I hand paint into the resin as into the layers and I build them up. And as I do that, it creates a lot of depth and dimension, but I'm also creating the structure of the carvings and adding and subtracting. Uh, this year I also have some canvas work as well that has a similar style, but it's a little bit more textural and a little bit, it doesn't involve resin at all, but it still is definitely uh, resonates with the imperfection component. Oh, so Canvas was really interesting. It took me about a year to develop a process that was able to uh, mimic the resin work without uh, making it look like I, it was coming from someone else. I wanted everyone to know that it was still my work, but I had clients that loved my work, but they wanted something a little less glossy, a little more textural, and it really helped me to expand my mind and ex expand different parts of my creativity into building an entirely new product. And it did take a lot of trial and error, which was great. She would come to the office and show me, and she's like, I'm not quite there. But really, translating this really fluid, you know, with the resin topping to just the canvas without the carving and that, it, it was it was really exciting to watch her go through that process and to not give up. And we always talk about how a lot of art is trial and error and um, solving problems. So you you did a great job, and hopefully everybody will take a look back at your studio to see how the two really go well together. Yeah, and the another part of Wabi Sabi, um, their philosophy is that when you're embracing your uh, mistakes, for lack of better words, when you're just enjoying the present moment and going through the process, you're able to create a more authentic process for your own creativity. And it really helped me, uh, through my mistakes, create an innovation that ended up being very beautiful. And they talk about that a lot, that through mistakes, inevitably, it becomes innovation, which then therefore become something brand new that you could appreciate and use and, and continue on with. And you work through the fear of kind of that transition and Oh yeah, it's it's not comfortable <laughs> by any means. Um, but I think growth comes from first and foremost being uncomfortable. And it's important to try and get as comfortable as you can with being uncomfortable because then you're continuously growing. So it's really stepping outside of the box and stepping outside of your own comfort zone. And uh, yeah, it's it's definitely uh, definitely fear provoking, but it, it ends up always becoming something something beautiful in the end. The trusting the process, which is part of the definition, I think. Yes. All right. So well, that's the we got to handsome guy between two beautiful women. How lucky are you? <laughs> so, Troy is an immensely talented, I always call him a glass artist, because that's really who he was or what he did when we first met, but you are a multifaceted artist with everything from, you know, terrazzo tile design to the, to the stained glass, to the fused glass, to the uh, mixed media. And you are somebody who definitely is not hooked on perfection, and I, and I think, but I think that's why so many beautiful works of art come from people who are not like so worried about doing it wrong, 
and I'm going to slide it back in front of you. This is one of Troy's, and then over here we have his mixed media piece. Um, so, thanks, Siva. Um, so yeah, I'm an inch from Moody. I work primarily with glass. I started, I grew up drawing and painting. Um, I remember as a kid, you know, arranging things on the table into compositions, you know, so I was always working with whatever objects I found around me. Um, but then hitchhiking through Europe, I found stained glass, I found abstract stained glass. That lit me on fire 25 years ago. Um, and that's what really sent me down the path as a professional artist. Um, I started fusing glass in the late 90s. Um, and it's been maybe five or six years that I started combining the, the acrylic paintings. Um, mostly what I'm doing, if you see this piece here, I'm doing kelp formed fused glass over acrylic paintings. Um, I've been very fortunate that I've done, like Susan mentioned, some very large-scale public art. Um, I've been fortunate that most of the projects that I've been allowed to do, um, they gave, they, they trusted me to, they, they saw something in the aesthetic that I was bringing forward and said, hey, we dig what you're doing. Let's do it in this medium. Let's do it on this footprint. Let's do it on this scale and this dimension. Um, so I've always just kind of brought whatever it is that I'm doing into these different mediums. Um, I think, uh, you know, the idea of like the art of imperfection, like a part of me is like, no, like, F that, my work perfect, right? Yeah. But no, like, but it, it is, it's perfectly imperfect, you know? There's that, there's a, like a Buddhist um, philosophy that every snowflake lands in exactly the right place, right? So what I'm doing, I'm involved, I'm intentionally moving colors, I'm intentionally cutting glass and placing things down. But there's also a part of it that um, if I can get my head right, and if I can get my ego out of the way, um, it just kind of happens. And I think that's a part of like the, the wabi-sabi that, you know, that we were talking about, um, that it is mistakes, it's somewhat in an unintentional, it's, it's spontaneous, it's intuitive. Um, and I think probably all of the artists here, like we can agree, um, like, you know, I spent so many years, you know, the whole 10,000 hours becoming infinitely familiar with the, with the material or a, a product or a process, that now when I'm working with glass, me, my construct, Troy Moody, doesn't really have to be there. It's just kind of happening. Um, and I'm getting out of the way. So because I've been so long, you know, cutting glass. I worked for years in studios making stained glass commissioned windows, um, you know, designed and built, renders for thousands of windows, um, ecclesiastic work. That it's like, okay, I spent the time, I sharpened my teeth, I know how to cut the glass, I know what the material is going to do, and now I can get out of the way and I can just improvise and let stuff happen. Um, and that's a really great place to be. It's really fun. I'm really fortunate that I spent the time to get to where I can do that. Um, so, so I want to have you talk a little bit about um, how, how did it feel for you to go from glass being your medium, picking up a paintbrush to a blank canvas, because it's, to me it's using different skill set and different, uh, not different parts of your brain, but it's definitely, instead of collaging, you know, assembling glass and now you're starting with a blank canvas painting. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I guess if I'm brutally honest, when I first started doing it in this setting, it was extremely intimidating. Because as you know, this tent is filled with really exceptional painters um, that have spent years and years or decades becoming intimately familiar with their craft um, and how to manipulate the paint. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was shy about it and, and insecure and, oh my gosh, what am I doing? But, um, like I said, when I, when I can get my head right, when I can get the ego out of the way, when I'm, when I'm there alone working, um, it's very intuitive. It feels natural and fun. It is uncomfortable, but um, I guess I like being uncomfortable, you know. I enjoy that, that odd sensation. I can say that, like the piece here, um, it's, it's kiln corn glass and it's acrylic painting. Um, the glass work took me a fraction 
of the time that it took me to do the painting. The glass work, when I get there, it just kind of happens. Um, I, I should put on my salesman hat and say, oh no, it takes me weeks to create this. You know, but it, at this point, it, it really just kind of happens. Whereas the painting, I think I'm done, and then it's hours later, and I'm like, oh, maybe more blue here, and let the strip happen here. And, um, so yeah, it's definitely, you know, it's, it's flexing different muscles, it's, it's going into unknown territory, and I enjoy that. And you do it well, and you pull it all together. So um, I guess another, another topic, or another title for this could be evolution, because that's also what we're talking about here for each of these artists. And, um, Sandra, when I first met Sandra Sani, we call her, which is much more fun. Um, you were doing primarily black and white photos, botanicals, so forth, and then you evolved into uh, layered technique and juxtaposition of photography with paint overlay. And now there's another evolution you're ongoing into the painting. And uh, you get this one. Okay. 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 Oh, should I do it? Um, yeah. Um, with my, I have both bodies of work back there. I'm on that side, the very back. And I do have uh, this realism that is um, photo based, um, very more technical, um, very like, you know, they were talking about not being perfect. This is like perfectionism. <laughs> I'm a perfectionist. So it's, there are mistakes and there's happy mistakes, but um, overall it's a very, with photography, the way you're taught and everything, it's very, I don't know how else to put it, anal. It's like you have to be really precise and everything. So I went through some life changes a few years, a few years ago and I decided I need to just be free and not be so controlled with my work. And so I took on abstract painting, which was, um, I was actually encouraged by people like Richard Hall because he was like, you know, you've been an artist for years, so just, you're painting, you know design, you know all that, and it just come. And man, was it hard. I mean, it was like so difficult to turn off realism and go to abstract, it's like a brain thing. I could not get my brain to go switch over. And it, uh, every time I try to do abstract, there's something literal in there, and it's like, no, <laughs> I want it to be abstract. So um, it took me a couple of years of just uh, keeping on trying to do this. And um, what I found is that I was so insecure and so intimidated by um, all the paintings, the painters that I saw. And I had a newfound respect for abstract painters because a lot of people think, oh, my kid could do that. It's just thrown on there. And it's not true. It's the most, I would say, it's the most difficult kind of painting you can do because realism, you have something from life to look at that you can copy. Abstract comes from within. So it's really, it's really difficult. And you have to, you have to allow yourself to come out and express what you, that abstract, painting is going to be. And so what I learned is um, it's okay to make mistakes and that's the key right there is first go ahead and make some really ugly stuff that's just like horrid but you're, at least you're doing something. <laughs> and um, I had a, a, a patron come over the other day and he's like he wants to paint he's like I'm so afraid to start and I'm like it's just paint just throw it on there you can paint over it. But um, what I found is you have to make ugly before you can make beautiful. And so sometimes um, it starts, you know, you're, you're, you've got this blank canvas and you're like, okay, what am I gonna paint? I'm not gonna paint a landscape because that's literal, so what am I gonna paint? So you just, what I found is mark making really helps. Just go and don't think at all and just start throwing paint or pencil or charcoal on the canvas and just um, dive into it and just start without thinking. So your subconscious is going and you're allowing that to come through. And everybody makes marks different like a fingerprint. So it's, it's 
kind of interesting that way. But that gets that start on the canvas where you're, now you don't have a white blank canvas that you're afraid of. Now you've got marks on there and now you can start to produce something. And I find that you have to go through a very ugly painting stage where you're like, this looks like it's just junk and it's not gonna be anything. But, um, but the beauty then, you keep pushing yourself and then you have to step away from it sometimes a couple days and then all of a sudden you start to make this thing that makes sense and it becomes beautiful. So that painting on the, the left, the tall one, um, that was three different paintings. This is the third that it's been. <laughs> um, so it was this kind of painting that had paint thrown on it and this and that. It was like, to me, kind of amateurish. And then I painted into it and it was, then it was truly um, interesting but ugly. <laughs> and um, and then just a couple months ago, I I figured out what it needs. And I you know you put things away for a while and then you bring it out and then all of a sudden you know maybe what to do with it. And so that has um, become one of my favorite pieces because it's evolved, but it's got all this history underneath it, which makes a really beautiful painting when you have a lot of history under it. If you just, if I just went in going, I'm going to paint that abstract exactly like that, it would take me 10 minutes to do, and it would be, there would be no depth to it. But because of all that history, it adds a lot of depth to the piece. And then um, I'm excited about um, this new work. Oh, yeah. That kind of sounds like life. Yeah, it is. Anyone else think that? True, it's true. true. It, no, it is. Um, this this is I'm excited about this work because it's um, yeah it's cold. it's a little bit tacky it won't it won't matter if you touch it but if just don't get it on your clothes or something it's not gonna it's just wax on the top but um, that is exciting because it's um, a totally different way of working with um, oil and cold wax medium and um, instead of brushes I'm using tools and. Um, it's just, it's just really fun and you can carve into it and you can mono print on it. There's so many, it's a, sort of an endless um, medium for me that I've discovered that I really like. Um, uh, I'm really enjoying it. So that's my latest work. It's textural. It's very textural and I can keep going on over and over on it and create a lot of history that I can carve back into. So I, I, I'm really enjoying that work too. Another thing you all have in common is each of you, the work you do has texture to it, whether um, from, you know, still being seen or covered up, but can you talk a little bit about your technique, kind of, on the resin pieces and how you get the color and the... Yeah, so with my resin work, it's a continuous process <laughs> of adding and subtraction over layers of resin. So I start out with a Baltic birchwood, and I, on average, I do about five layers of resin per piece. I hand carve and hand paint in between the layers as I build them up. So I'm constantly adding, subtracting, adding, subtracting as I layer it up. And the final coat, the final coat is a torched clear coat of resin, which is just, gives it a really glossy glass-like finish. So you can see into the piece and it feels like it goes on forever because of all the work that's done underneath. Inspired you, what first inspired you to? Oh. Okay, so it's actually funny. Um, so I was classically trained in fine art and I went through the whole art school deal and I loved it and I really wanted to differentiate myself and figure out what my niche was. And I had no idea how I was going to do that. Uh, my father, as a hobby, worked on cars for fun. So there was always leftover auto body paints, polyurethanes, and solvents in our garage. And so, uh, you know, coming from a family of, of engineers and that hobby, I was able to experiment and explore with um, my dad's help and my family's help. Uh, and see, you know, what it, what happens if I add this solvent into this polyurethane? What's it going to do? <laughs> Let's just see what happens. Is it going to change the color? Is it going to change the shape? I don't know. So, 
that evolution led me to explore a lot of other different things like floor finishes and uh, amber shellacs. I mean, you name it. I went to Home Depot. I tried it all. <laughs> And then eventually I transitioned over into resin from there, and it's, it's been fantastic. I love that story. Did, did you always wear safety gear? Oh, yeah. Well, my dad's in the audience right now, and he can confirm. He's back there in the back corner over there. Yeah, yeah. You just throw your kid out in the garage and let her play with some yeah. solvents. Yeah. No, that safety was first and foremost okay. the most important thing. Okay, that's good. Yeah. And what a, what a great evolution it's been from that point. Oh so, yeah, it's been so it's been so fun and it's consistently evolving. And I know we did a podcast earlier in this year, and one of your inspirations. A lot of times I'll ask here at this audience or when we do the podcast, what museums inspire you or what works of art inspire you? And nature is certainly your main in inspiration, and specifically granite formations and granite. We talked about. You know, you like to go to the the granite stores and look at all the different colors, and that's all nature speaks to you. Yeah, it is, and it just reminds you again, a slab of granite forms over a long time. It's not perfect. It is what it is, but we all have, we all think it's beautiful, depending on our color preferences and things like that. You'll look at things from nature all the time, and they're not, there's, there's no, you know, trying to be perfect. It just, it is what it is, and we think nature is one of the most beautiful things um, that we can experience in our life. So, I do love that, absolutely. Sometimes imperfections are what makes it so beautiful, right? Just like people. If you look at the, uh, most of us, we're not symmetrical. We all have like little differences, and that's what makes us each unique and, and beautiful. Oh. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And imperfection is authentic. And authenticity is uh, one of the most, I would say one of the most important things that when you meet someone who you can feel is really authentic, it really draws you in more than anything else, more than any type of beauty you could ever see or experience. Authenticity is by far one of the most beautiful things. And, and I'm just going to say, probably one of the things that people like a lot about this show is you can walk around and talk to each of the individual artists, and they're all authentic in their own way and, and sharing their view of the world for all of us. And although some are more precise in how they paint or, or sculpt or what they do, but they're still sharing you know, their vision of the world, and that's, that's a really special thing. So, um, so Troy... One of the other things, several pieces, I, one of the pieces I have from you is kind of sharing history and memorabilia. Um, how many of you grew up in the Midwest and remember Stuckey's? Yeah, like when we ever had a road trip, we wanted to stop at Stuckey's. So some of your pieces, I don't know if this one has it, but you use, found, you talked about it earlier, found objects or, um, but I have this great kind of bowl shaped sort of like this that has. Where did you find that stuff, this thing? It was a photo I, I took. Okay. From, um, I, grew up, I grew up outside of Dallas, Texas. My family's been in Arizona for generations. So every summer, as crazy as that seems, yeah, yeah. Um, we, would, we would drive from Texas into Arizona, and then we would go up onto Mount Graham, which is a mountain three hours southeast of here. Um, so like that was definitely a part of my childhood was um, watching a lot of these man-made structures, you know, these these icons of pop culture being, you know, eaten up and, and swallowed by the desert and abandoned um, as the interstate, you know, came up and as our um, populations moved to different areas. Um, so that was always something that intrigued me was like the um, impermanence of, of all things. Um, and, you know, Stucky, obviously. If, if you grew up anywhere traveling across the country, you probably have recognized Stucky. Um, and it was really strange. Like, it's one of these places you go into, and, like, as a kid, I remember going into the Stuckies at some random stop in the middle of New Mexico, and they're selling alligator 
pods, you know, and it's like, what's the relevance? It's basically that? a truck stop, but it was cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 but it's great, like, we love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, so I, I definitely take a lot of that imagery. Um, you know, there's always, like, this notion, like, we, we always hear the term, you know, found objects that a lot of artists are incorporating into their work. I do it. Um, but then I also incorporate, you know, like, found imagery, you know, and, and found aesthetics um, and narratives. And I incorporate that into my work. Um, I think that um, it sounds like we've all kind of talked already a little bit about how really what we're doing is, is, is somewhat autobiographical. You know, like I hate to sound totally self-indulgent, but what I'm doing is what I'm doing. You know, it's definitely my reinterpretation of the world I'm experiencing. Um, and the found imagery and narratives that I come across that somehow come lodged in my brain, then I, I use that as image transfers and they get incorporated into my, into my work. So I want to talk about um, something a lot of our artists here work with patrons doing commission work. And what that basically means is if, if you have something that you want created specifically for you, you can work with almost any artist here in the, in the show will do a personalized commission. And we think of it sometimes more like Judy Dickinson is here. She's a fantastic portrait artist. And you can give her images and you will be astounded at the realism of that. Doing commission work as an abstract artist has to be a little bit more complicated, but I know you each will do that. And I think the, the most important element of any commission work, and certainly abstract, is the trust between the artist and the collector because you can't determine if it looks like the fresca can at the end of it, because it's not going to look exactly like that. You're going to trust the artist to use their view their view of the world to create something that speaks to you. But I know each of you have done that. And Troy, um, we had some landscape work done this a couple months ago, and the guy I worked with, did I tell you this already? Um, he knows you. I can't remember his name now. But anyway, he, you've done projects with him. And he studied, he walked into my house and he was like, looking around at all the art and we have some Troy Moody. And he's like, I think I know that. Oh no, no, here's what happened. <laughs> he, Jake collects cars and he saw a couple of cars. And he said, I said, oh, my husband likes cars. And he said, oh, I love cars. I used to have this blah, blah, blah. And then he said something about, um, he had VWs, and I said, oh, I know a guy that used to work with restoring VWs, but now he's a full-time artist, and he said, I think I met that guy, I've been to that tent show out there, and I talked to him, and I'm like, that's what we do. So, anyway, long story, he told me that you and he had worked on several landscape projects, so I would like to hear from each of you how that commission experience works in the world of imperfection and abstractism. Whoever wants to take that. All right, go ahead. Um, so for me, uh, with my style and, and having developed it from a very specific source, uh, you can definitely tell it's my work. So uh, people kind of know what they're coming into when they want a custom piece. But the thing that I like to do with commission work is once we get the size and we get a couple different color palettes that that uh, the client is, is interested in, I tend to make uh, a few 12 by 12 samples for the client to show the combination of colors, how they're gonna work together, how they may react together, and then present them first before we even start the final piece so that the client can kind of see which direction they wanna go with it. And um, it's, it's really nice to have that little extra step with contemporary artwork, especially because uh, the client feels more involved and they don't feel so much like they're in the dark and they have no idea what they're about to get or what the design is going to look like. So uh, that's my personal preferred way of doing it thus far. And you, you did a magnificent piece for the person's dining room recently. Oh yeah, that was great. So um, I had a client 
up in Rio Verde and she wanted this really large six foot by six foot piece to go in her dining area. And she had these beautiful chairs, beautiful chairs with turquoise and browns and I mean, everything that you could think of revolving around like a Southwestern, all the different Southwest blues. And she loved it and they kind of, they cascaded a bit and she said, I want something that's going to enhance my chairs that I have because they're custom and I love them. And for me, that's music to my ears because part of the thing I love to do is I love to create artwork that's not only beautiful on the wall, but I love to create pieces that enhance everything from your furniture to your decor, all the above. I want the whole room to become more alive when the final piece is installed. So we did that work of art and uh, I mirrored a little bit of the blues cascading. We added a little bit of metallic and, and she was really happy and um, when my clients are happy, that's the most important thing to me. Absolutely, 100%. So that was a great project. Um, all right, so commission work. So um, obviously, like I said, I started 20, uh, 25 years ago um, doing traditional stained glass. Um, obviously, stained glass, by the nature of the medium, generally is commissioned. It's very site specific. It's, you know, architectural setting. Um, so early on in my career, most of my work was commissioned. So I got really comfortable um, speaking with clients, collectors, design committees, architects, um, public art boards, all of that. Um, so I got really comfortable working in that regard to figure out what they wanted from the project and then try to make something um, that's hopefully gonna to, to fill all their needs and satisfy all their needs and the public at large that's going to be viewing it. Um, I'm really fortunate that, you know, the last uh, 10 years or so, um, most of my commissioned work is work that's generated from collectors, mostly here at the celebration, um, that come in and they see my work and they, they see something that I made spontaneously from the heart, alone in the studio, um, just for myself and something resonates and they say, wow, like that speaks to us, we dig that, we want, we want that same feeling, can you do it in this size or in this transit window or, you know, in this space to match the chairs or whatever. Um, and hopefully um, we develop a rapport and, you know, we have this trust where um, they know that I'm capable of that I'm doing. They've given me at least something to go on, some color palette, something to hold on to, um, and then I'm off and running. Um, so, you know, so yeah, I, I, I definitely thoroughly enjoy doing commission work, um, even more so now, that it usually is coming from a place where they're, they're being inspired by work that I've already done from an autonomous place. It's something that I've done, you know, of my own, and then they, they take that, and then they, they want to go abstract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still abstract. And I think, um, a little bit darker, but I think it's important, I'm sure we would all agree, like, we're talking about abstract work, and obviously we're working predominantly abstract, but that doesn't mean that we're getting away from, like, rules of composition and foreground and midground and color palettes. Like, all of the stuff that makes a realistic or representational work successful, that same stuff goes into abstract work. Um, and whether we're working with a client or a collector to make a commission piece or we're just working from our own spirit, you know, in the studio, we're still processing all of that stuff. We're still crafting a work of art using those same rules. I think that sort of describes your going from ugly art to awesome art. Um, well, um, I find that uh, commission work is um, a lot of artists I talk to, a lot of them won't even do it because it, I think it is more difficult because it's, someone starts to dictate what they want so they're sort of like art directing you. And um, last year at the end of the show, I had a couple of pieces that were like abstract grasses, kind of, uh, I mean the feeling of grass, not grasses, but you know, just abstract. And a couple came in and they really liked it, but they go, well, but we need it. It was just two pieces and they need, we need it to cover this huge niche. And 
it had to be three panels, much bigger, I don't know. Um, and they actually brought me colors, but their colors were like on objects, and I was taking pictures, and it was kind of hard, you know, because it was like, well, how's that going to translate from my phone to the canvas? And so then I just said to her, um, why don't you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, get a bunch of paint chips, and, and <laughs> make an X on the ones you like. <laughs> And she did, and she sent it all to me. And then it was like, ah, now I gotta do this. <laughs> and it was, um, I had a couple issues, which is interesting. I, st I paint on um, unstretched raw canvas um, when I start, um, and then I stretch it later. But these were to be mounted on, on panel, like board like this. And what I didn't think about, and I did the three, panels is that when you gesso, it shrinks. And I did all this work on these three pieces and my husband made the panels for me and then we put them on and I'm like, oh man, they're not the right size. They shrunk quite a bit. And I was like, duh, I never, I didn't think about that. You know, I should have. So start over. But you know what? It made a much better painting because the first one was like almost an exercise and I've learned from my mistakes, you know, what I should do differently. And it turned out really beautifully, and they were really happy with it. But, um, but abstract, some, I mean, um, commission work, sometimes um, the customer, it's, it's, it's a little intimidating because you're like, what if they don't like it? What if, what if it's not the right colors that they, what if the composition? So you kind of go nuts a little bit, and then you have to go, I don't care what they think, I'm gonna do what I wanna do. And it turns out beautiful and they love it. So that's, that's kind of what I've done with all my commissions is you go through this process of like, what if, what if, what if, and then, and then you go, I don't care anymore, and then it comes out. Because if you make yourself go by what they say, it's gonna be contrived and awful. And so that's part of that letting yourself, giving yourself the permission to, okay, I know the color range they want, I know the idea they want, but I'm gonna do it my way. And they always love it because it, it's not contrived and it blows, it's beautiful. And if you've listened well to what they told you, you've got captured their thoughts and they wanted, they wanted you, so, that partnership of trust is what creates the best works of art. I was talking with Michael Jones um, last week about, he was doing a gate design for a client, and he asked a lot of questions, but this particular client kept coming up with new ideas, and finally Michael said, I'm just gonna do what I think represents you, and the client ended up being thrilled. You know, it was one of those, and, uh, it was all about the trust. So I think I, mean, I think in any commission, that's really important and certainly an abstract. This kind of matches my outfit. <laughs> one more thing about yeah, one more thing about commissions is it, it it because of the uncomfortable position it sometimes puts you in, it pushes you, it pushes you hard, and you actually become a better painter because the more commissions you do, I think. Um, it puts you in a, in a direction you might not know or really go. And so it, it's, a, it's a nice um, learning and developing experience. Um, looking at the title, this is called Walking with the Moon. How do you guys come up with the titles? Um, titles are hard sometimes, um, but sometimes um, when I'm in my studio and listening to music, I'll hear a lyric and I'll write it down. And I'll just write down all, and it's not like the whole lyric, you know, it's just a piece of it. Um, sometimes I do that and I make a list of things I like. And then other times I just, I don't know, this doctor told me I should, I should walk in moonlight. He says, you shouldn't be in the sun, you should walk at night in the moon. And I'm like, okay, well he actually wasn't a doctor, he was an Indian guy. And <laughs> I was like, a healer, I don't know what he was. He, he, he diagnosed me while I was eating dinner at his restaurant. 
And he kind of was a lot of it right on, which was really weird. I'm like, hmm. Um, but he says, you know, you should, I live in Santa, Santa Fe, New Mexico, and he says, this is the wrong climate for you. It's not your area. You shouldn't be living here and this stuff. And I was like, okay. And he goes, and you should walk at night in the moon. And I was thinking, hmm. And he goes, moonlight's very good for you. So that's kind of why I named it that, because I remembered that, and I was trying to think of a title, and I just, you know, came up with that. Anyway. <laughs> that's a good one. Anyone else want to answer that? I think it, it kind of differs all the time. I mean, sometimes um, I'll come up with a title if I create a new piece and I think, oh, that looks like it looks like a slab of quartz. I, you know, I might name it something um, off that, or sometimes it could be uh, an emotional place that you're coming from that you think other people might be able to relate to, um, and then maybe might be able to see in your work. And then sometimes just random things come into your head, and you just think, "Yep, that that's going to be born to be this 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 name." So. It all depends too, and sometimes it also um, does not come immediately. A lot of times that can be really difficult is, is naming your pieces and figuring out what you think is gonna be a fitting name and, uh, and all that, so it changes all the time. Um, yeah, I think similar experience. Um, definitely a lot of time, you know, I'm alone in the studio working, and you know, I usually have the radio on, and uh, some string of words resonates with me and I, I scribble them down. Um, my workbench in the studio is, well, it's chaos at this point, but there's all kinds of random notes scribbled down. Um, but usually the, the title that eventually gets tagged onto a piece um, relates to whatever mental process I was going through um, during that process. Um, and sometimes it's triggered by um, text or imagery that I incorporate into the work. Um, like this piece, um, I titled it um, Your Future Construct or Future Construct. Um, and I, that was not preconceived. That was, you know, I was just working on it. And, and it, you know, the glass came together in one stage and there was actually um, three or more paintings at various times and then they kind of got put together. And at one point I was doing a lot of collage work with I was tearing up old comic books and working those in. And one of the back pages was one of these, it was like from a 1971 comic book. And it was one of these things like, you know, telling kids to consider their future. You know, like, oh, what are you gonna do when you grow up? And it was like, consider your future as a veterinarian, as a pharmacist, as a blah, 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 as a blah, blah, blah. And um, I didn't think about it at the time, but one of those pages got embedded into the pieces, and you can kind of see a little peak of it where it says your future. Um, and most of the rest of the text is obscured under the rest of the painting. Um, but yeah, that was it. So I was like, oh, that was all done. Um, you know, it made me think of, like, well, when I was a kid, ever since I can remember, the, my only concept was, oh, I'm an artist. I'm going to be an artist. I had no idea what that meant. I still don't know what that means. I never had, like, a career plan. Um, but, you know, we become what we pretend to be, and, and that's, that's where that came from. Lots of good advice comes from comic books. For sure. <laughs> For sure. So, um, I'd love to see if any of our friends have questions. <laughs> this, this one here. Um, so this is another piece, another piece that I did. So this is all, it's kiln formed glass and with welded steel. Um, once upon a time for a little blip, I thought, ooh, I'm gonna start doing steel. And so I started welding, and I've done a lot of collaborations with metal workers, you know, where we do work together. Um, but I decided steel is like heavy and dirty and loud. Um, so this is one of the few pieces that I completely fabricated myself. Um, but it, it, it I approached the steel work just like I've always approached the glass work. I just found different components there alone in the studio, laying them out on the bench and figuring out what would work, and then um, started welding it together. Um, a lot of it has found, found shapes, um, intentional and perfection. Um, 
And then the glass panel itself is kiln formed. It was in the kiln numerous times. A lot of times when I fuse glass, I make components where I'm arranging glass in a kiln and I fire that. And then I arrange other stuff in a kiln and I fire that. And then eventually I've got boxes and boxes of these components. They're like ready-made brush strokes. And then when I'm ready to compose a piece, then I go in there and turn the brain off and hopefully get in the right space and just start arranging it. So this was an arrangement of pre-made components kiln form. Are, are, are each of these pieces separate? Yeah, so um, it, it, it might be, you know, visually obvious. So, like, so there's obviously a glass panel and then there's the steel. But the glass itself is, most of it is, most of any of my fused glass is two layers of glass, um, sometimes three or four layers um, that I'm piling up. So a lot of it, like these kind of crackly alligator skin textures that you see here, those were some that I, I make that one day. And then, um, you know, I make these little squigglies one day. And then at the end of the week, I go in there and just start arranging and making stuff happen. Do you have to fire each time you put another layer on, or is it you stack it and fire? Um, depends on what I'm doing. So usually, um, yeah, all of the components are fired separately, and then they go into one composition. They're fired, and then usually I'll decide. Ooh, that's almost there, but not quite. And then I'll go in and add more lines or frit, which is crushed up glass crumbs, um, to get the kind of peppering effect, to give it more of a painterly effect. So it's, most of the glass has been in the kiln numerous times. And what did you name it? What should we name it? <laughs> um, I called it a monument to tomorrow's yester to yes to tomorrow's a monument to yesterday's tomorrow's. So it was, again, it's kind of like your future construct. It had to do with, you know, all of these things were that stuff that I made yesterday. I put it together for something that hopefully will resonate for somebody tomorrow. Thank you. Very poetic, yes. Um, other questions? Myself. A lot of times when I'm not here, um, I'm, I'm also involved at the Mesa Art Center, which is a super cool facility, blah, blah, blah. But when I'm not there and I'm not here, I'm alone talking to the dog, you know? <laughs> so it's nice to have people to chat with. You know? Real people. Yes. Actual people to talk about. Yeah. Oh, another question. Hannah, I want to ask So this one was called, I named it Undulate. Undulate? Yeah, Undulate. Because it was, it reminded me of the undulation of the ocean, but then it's also got almost a sunset style feel. So I thought the movement was really what helped me to kind of contrive the name that I thought would be good for that. Thank you so much. In response to your comment, I wanted to say, um, uh, when a, an artist I know, because um, I used to do on the road shows, like travel from California to Massachusetts and do shows all the way, and be gone, do this show too, so I'd be gone five months of a year selling art and, and then creating art the rest of the time. So when you're creating art, it's like one artist put it, and I thought it was so perfect, because like you're a monk at home when you're creating art, because you're just they're alone. And then when you're on the road, you can be social, or when you're here, you can be social. But what I like about shows is when I get to meet the patron, is um, as artists, when you're home at your studio, you don't know if your piece is, 
you might think it's okay, it might, you're not sure about it, you're not, but when you get the feedback from the public, like all you guys, it really helps because um, there's, there's pieces that might get totally ignored and then there's pieces that get a lot of attention. And it's not that I would create according to that, but it's good to get the feedback because it encourages you and just sort of feeds your um, creative juices that, oh man, everybody loves this. It doesn't mean I'm gonna only do that, but it just, it just helps and it helps you grow as an artist too. Great incubator here, for sure. Mm -hmm. well, um, any other questions from anybody? Yes, please. It's maybe kind of personal, but I, you know, you put yourself out there as an artist, a writer, anything like that, and so I am sure that most of us aren't walking around and, as you say, maybe we're ignoring something that doesn't appeal to us that much or complimenting you, but also I'm sure you get whiffs of, oh, what's that? I don't like that. Does it? Does it just for you or just brush it off and you don't care? Um, I brush it off because um, in the early days I was terrified to show my work and when I first started I, would, I wouldn't even show it to anyone and um, and then you know as you start to show it and you're in shows you gain confidence in yourself and your work and so um, being an artist is you're putting it out there and some people do say, oh, what drugs are you on? And, or what, you know, and I never did any drugs. <laughs> but I mean, you know, people say things and I just take it as like, that's them. I don't have, I know if every single person that walked in said, oh, what's this crap? Then I would be like, okay, I better leave. But for, for the one person that says something negative about it, and it's funny because they'll talk about it right in front of you like you're not there. And it's like, it's like, I find it amusing. But um, for every, you know, um, person that says something, like that, there's 90 people that like it. So then you go, okay, if everybody hated it or said something negative, then you would know. But uh, to me, good art should, should um, either um, get a bad reaction or a good reaction. So, I mean, you go to the museum, not everybody likes everything at the museum either, and that's like world-class art. So, um, so you just have you just develop a skin of um, um, probably if another artist told you it was it was crappy, you'd probably be more hurt or something. But it, it depending if you like their art, <laughs> maybe. But um, but I think um, it just it, you just let it roll off you, you know. Um, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> I mean, I do. I mean, I'm human, of course. You know, like, yeah, it hurts if somebody says something that you poured your heart into, like, oh, that's ugly, or what is this idiot thinking? Um, but really, I don't care, because, I mean, I know that there's something that all of y'all are into that I couldn't care at all about, you know? And so you don't all have to love the greater world. They don't all have to love what I'm into. Um, and you just look at pop culture, like look at the stuff that sells sometimes out there. And you know the banana take the deck. <laughs> yes. right, right? There you go. You know? Um, so but yeah, I mean like like Connie was saying, I mean you definitely develop a thicker skin. Um, and also like Connie was saying, the one of the great things about this show is, you know, there's a hundred ish artists here um, that whether their particular style is something that I resonate with or want to live with, I can appreciate their talent and their skill um, and the quality of their work. So if another artist here comes and gives me honest feedback or critique, then yeah, like I'll definitely internalize that and, and decide whether I care and, and see how that might affect my work. I, I think that's a really good question and, and it, it impacts also when we jury the show because we love art but there I, I may or may not want to have a piece of art from every artist in the show but we we learn to recognize what is quality and uh, art that's made with resonance instead of just somebody who's painting whatever they think will sell what we're looking for when we jury is 
hate to overuse the word authentic, but you know, art that comes from somebody's soul that we know that they're doing because it's what they're driven to do and they're doing it to the best of their ability. Yet we know that everybody who comes isn't going to like every single piece of art in the show. But um, also it was a topic on a podcast with our three 30-year artists, Marty LeMessure, Green Fulcher, and Kirk Randall. And they, they all talked about that first year because most of them had never really showed any collect a collective like this about they had to grow thick skin because you're standing right here and people kind of don't they don't even notice that like you know what was she thinking oh but um, but it also most of the artists here would admit it's contributed to their growth like as a human being and as in their work you know the good and the bad and I just thought of an interesting stat that um, definitely has to do with what you're talking about. I don't know if uh, any of you are familiar with Wayne Dyer. He's written many amazing books. He's one of my favorites. And uh, the stat is that on your best day, 53% uh, of people will agree with you on your best day, and the rest will not. So, yeah, so I thought that was absolutely fascinating, and I think about that a lot, too. That's what makes it real interesting. If we all like the same stuff, I was just thinking sometimes people that, uh, we get a lot of people that are um, uh, want to dabble in art or it's a hobby or they're trying to be an artist that come here and ask questions. And um, sometimes they ask, like, um, they kind of want to create something that they know will sell and be a seller. And I'm like, that's the first mistake right there. If you create something, if you try to second judge, second um, guess the public, what they're going to like, it's done for you. You're not going to ever be a good artist, and, and it's it has to come from here, and what I, I do bodies of work, I have three different bodies of work on my website, and it's like, um, all of them, I did what I wanted to do, and I thought, I don't know if anyone's going to like this, but I like it, and just so happens, they like it too, so not, not, not the hundred percent, but the percent that I need, and it's it's um, so you can't second guess what's going to be a, a really good selling piece or a body of work, and think about it in terms of the money and all that. You can't do that, or it, it will just fail. True statement. Yes, Wendy. Um, I just like to make a comment from the opposite side of things in terms of this is probably appropriate when we're talking about mistakes and imperfections. As someone who started coming here many years ago, I knew nothing. I was too afraid to go into the studios. So it was probably an imperfection on my part because I was trying to be perfect and trying to think of something intelligent to say to somebody so I could look at their art. And so from our perspective, I know it's difficult for some of the artists to come and talk here, but in doing so, it makes it a lot easier to try and go into a studio and at least start off with something that you could say to somebody to learn more about their art. And so, you know, you go from thinking, I've got to have something perfect that I can say that shows I know something. When I started with not knowing much of anything, but over the years being able to visit the artists in the studios has eased that off. And talking today about perfection and imperfection, yeah, it's both sides of the street. That's, I should have had a mic on that. I don't know how many of you heard that, but I'm going to recap. She said from the, from the patron viewpoint, a lot of patrons come in here and think they have to be asking the perfect question or be knowledgeable before they ask questions. So um, basically, I think it's we should just all celebrate being imperfect, and that we're all here to learn together and to evolve and grow together. And you know, we, the artists, welcome the questions, and and the, the growth has happened in so many of the artists because of the interaction with collectors over the over the years. So um, we welcome the questions, and and we're all perfectly imperfect. So I think that's a great uh, celebration right there. So are you saying no dumb questions? No, no dumb questions. The only, the only dumb question is the one you don't ask, right? Yeah. 
So, uh, I don't know, I think you guys, I appreciate all of you being um, open to share and celebrating how imperfection is the thing of beauty and it's something that we really can resonate with and connect. And uh, thank you all very much. Thank you for being here.